In the year 43 AD, what is now Britain was first invaded by the Romans. With them they took legions of soldiers, strange languages, new technology and Christianity. This new religion would eventually find a strong foothold in Scotland, especially with those from the borders. But with the inception of this new god into an already suspicious and mystical culture, came the introduction of a far greater and far more sinister being, one which seduces humanity to sin and excess. Today we look at the devil's stolen grimoire, the Red Book of Appen. The Red Book of Appen is a supposed occult or demonic grimoire. Within its pages lie arcane knowledge, magic rites and rituals. Similar ancient tomes appear throughout history, like the Key of Solomon and the Book of Simon Magus. These books tend to contain spells and rituals, which involve dark powers. Followers of these books have been said to use the power within for good to trap or hold demonic entities and return them to the shadow, while others have used them to topple empires and enslave men to reinforce the armies of hell. One tale of the Red Book of Appen suggests that it was wrote by Vladimir Tepish, Vlad the Impaler, but the history around this version of the book is very sparse, and the truth behind the text cannot be validated. What is known is that it was first produced by an English merchant by the name of Joseph Appen and coincidentally was bound in red. This version has nothing to do with the true Red Book of Appen, named for the village in Scotland in which it was obtained. But if the Vlad story is false, then who is the true author of the Red Book? Unlike many of the other magical tomes, which were written by mortal men, the Red Book of Appen was penned by the Morning Star, the Son of the Dawn, the Bringer of Light, Lucifer, the Fallen Angel. This is the story of how a Scotsman obtained the Book of the Devil. In Argyle, on the west coast of Scotland, there is a small village called Appen. One day a man from the village, while out tending to his herd of sheep, stumbled upon a young orphan boy. The boy said he had no place to go and his parents were long gone. The man had not the heart to turn the boy away, so he took him home and raised him as his own. Years later, the boy now old enough to work was sent to tend the man's herd. While out in the hills, the boy spotted a gentleman clad in unusual garments heading up the path towards him. As the man approached, the boy could see he had strange, enthralling, bright blue eyes. The man greeted the boy and told him he was looking for a servant and the boy would fit that role perfectly. The man told the boy that if he were to serve him, there would always be plenty food and drink. He would be given the finest garments to wear and great wages. The boy was not happy with his life as a shepherd and had never seen such wealth and splendor as the man wore. He told the man he would very much like to serve him, but first he must ask his father. The gentleman beseeched the boy to enter his service now without delay, but no matter how he pushed, the boy would not agree to any terms without first consulting his father. The gentleman then produced a large red book and told the boy that if he couldn't agree to terms right now, at least write his name within the book. Still, the boy refused. The gentleman, looking disheartened, told the boy, if you will neither agree nor sign the book until you talk with your father, then shall we meet tomorrow in this very same place, just as the sun is setting. The boy promised to do so and with haste returned to his father and regaled him with the strange encounter. The boy's father was shocked by the tale and told him he had been incredibly fortunate not to sign his name in the Red Book. The father had heard similar stories in the past and all ended in horror. He told his son that since a promise was made to the gentleman, it must be upheld. He must meet the man tomorrow, but if he values his life, he will follow his father's instructions. The father gave the boy a sword and told him to arrive at the meeting place early so that he would have time to draw a circle around himself with the tip of the blade and name it for the Holy Trinity. 
In the centre of the circle, there would be a cross drawn. There the boy must stand, and for no reason move, until he has seen the light of the following dawn. He told the boy that the gentleman would wish him to move, to come out of the circle and away from the cross, to sign the red book, but on no account was he to leave the circle, but ask the man kindly to hand you the red book so that you can sign it. If the gentleman grants you this request, keep hold of the book and do not return it to him, but do not fear, you will be safe within the circle. The boy arrived at the spot early in the evening of the following day, just as his father bade him. The gentleman was nowhere to be seen, so the boy did as his father had instructed and sat in the circle waiting the man's arrival. He did not have much time to wait until the gentleman made his appearance and began to ask the boy to come with him to begin his new, wonderful life in service to the man. All he had to do was sign his name in the red book. The boy told him he wouldn't move, but he would like to sign the book, if only he could hold the book within his own hands, just to assure himself there was no trickery. The gentleman not pleased about this, tried to convince the boy he was being foolish, told him he was embarrassing himself with his naive behaviour, but still the boy paid him no heed and did not move. Finally, and after many hours, the gentleman agreed to hand the book to the boy so that he could sign it. But as the gentleman's hand crossed the circle, he suddenly recoiled in pain and the red book fell within the lines. Quickly the boy grasped the book and held it close to his chest. When the gentleman saw that the boy did not mean to sign or return the red book, his eyes turned red with fury and he screamed so loud the boy thought the sound itself would be the end of him. Flames and sulphurous smoke erupted from the man's nose and mouth. He tried to set up on the boy, but couldn't enter the circle. He transformed into a great black horse, and once again charged at the circle. Still the boy was safe. The horse then morphed again and became a horrific beast, unknown to the boy. With its large claws and flaming breath, the creature continued to attack the circle. This went on and on for the rest of the night. The boy struck with fear dared not move an inch. When the first rays of sunshine broke that morning, the beast let out another earth-shattering scream. Then its likeness became that of a large raven, and it was gone from the boy's sight. The boy, still terrified, stayed within the circle until the sun fully rose. Then he took to his souls and ran home as fast as he could. He told his father of his harrowing tale and presented him with the red book. This is how a mystical grimoire, possessed by the very devil himself, found its way into the hands of a Scotsman and how the red book of Appen came to be. This version of the story was written by a Mr. Hector Uckert, who worked collecting folk tales to include in the second volume of John Francis Campbell's popular Tales from the West Highlands. The tale comes from the 1860s and was told by a coal man known by the name of John. John told of a time when he was a young child and worked on his family's farm. One year, all of the cows on the farm were unable to produce milk. One by one, the family members tried all the remedies they knew of to solve this curious problem but to no avail. After days of trying homemade cures, John's father sent his older brother to get help. He was to go to the village of Appen and consult the Fearan Lardrig, or the Man of the Red Book. He returned with the shoe of an ungelded horse. This, he was told, was to ward off the evil eye. It has long been known in Scotland that many malevolent fairies and spirits have a dreadful fear of iron, and horses for that matter. The brother was told to nail the talisman above the buyer door so it could scare off any evil spirits and act as a counter charm if the farm had been cursed. Unfortunately, the text does not go on to say if the talisman worked or not, but it did go on to tell the origin story of the Red Book of Appen. While collecting stories for the book, Mr. Uckert said that he had met and talked with many older people all of whom had tales of the Red Book and its curative properties. Another Scottish folklore researcher 
by the name of Reverend John Gregerson Campbell, also wrote of the Red Book of Appen. He stated that the book was of such incredible power that the keeper of the Red Book would have to place a hoop of iron upon his head for protection before opening the pages. One time, a man looked over the shoulder of the reader and saw that the pages of the Red Book were glowing hot like plates of metal in a fire. The Reverend also tells of another possible origin story for the book. In this version, a man on horseback attends a gathering of witches and sorcerers. The devil, who was seated at the head of the congregation, was taking the names of all those in attendance and noting them within a large red book. When it got to the man's turn, he beseeched the beast to allow him to sign his own name in the book. But on being handed the tome, the man swiftly made off into the night. So quick was his horse that the witches or the devil could not catch up with him, and that is how the Red Book was obtained. It's an interesting alternate origin of the book, but even the Reverend stated that most of the people he had spoken with agreed that the first version was correct, or at least most prevalent. Reverend Gregerson also believes that for some time the book was owned and kept by the Stuarts of Invernale, who were male line descendants from the Stuarts of Appen, the main clan. They were also said to own the finest herd of cattle in all the Highlands. In the year 1700, a note written by Edward Lloyd, renowned Welsh linguist, commented on the Stuarts of Appen. He said that the Stuarts had a sovereign charm against the fairies, which they only communicated to their offspring. The charm was written on paper and intermingled with crosses. It was hung around the neck and protected the owner. They called this charm the Gospel. This note is one of the many pieces of evidence that suggests that the Stuarts may have had knowledge of the occult and at least were well versed in arcane writings. Another mention of the Red Book comes from a folklore compendium written by a Robert Craig McLagan in 1902. The tale was told to a Mrs. Smith by her grandmother. When she was young, the grandmother of Mrs. Smith lived on a farm above Loch Gilped. One year, none of the cows would produce any milk, and she could not make out the cause of it. On one day, a man came to talk with her father. She was told the visitor was the man of the Red Book. He had said that the farm had been cursed, and to be on the lookout for the one who had done it. With this, he went on his way. Close to that time, the farm had a fine cow, which was near calving. One of the farmhands told the farmer that a woman from the nearby village had asked the farmhand to inform her when the cow was to give birth. The farmer told the hand not to go anywhere near the woman until after the cow had calved. Then he was to tell her what had happened, and watch closely at her reaction. The farmhand, true to his word, went to the woman after the cow had calved and told her that the cow was ill, but did not mention the birth of the new calf. The woman, puzzled by the timing, thought of another way she could know the truth, and put a pot in the fire and left it to heat. When she eventually lifted the lid from the pot, she screamed in anger and disgust as the pot was full of cow dung. She shouted to the hand, You did not come to tell me as you had promised, you waited until after the calf was born. The farmhand, scared at this frightening sight, ran from the house and returned to the farm. It would seem that this incident was enough to now suspect the woman of witchcraft or black magic. The suspicion alone was enough to drive the woman from the village. After she had left, the cows on the farm began to produce milk again, all thanks to the advice from the man of the Red Book. From the multiple accounts, it would seem that in the early 19th century, the knowledge of a man living in Appen and possessing a red book of unnatural powers and mysterious origin was alive and well within the memory of the people of Argyll. In 1993, a Mr Hugh Cheap wrote an academic paper on the history and knowledge of the Red Book of Appen. He proposed that the book was a treatise on human and veterinary medicine which was compiled in Scotland during the late 16th century. The book may have been an important and influential manuscript in terms of its medical knowledge. There is also some evidence 
that the book may have specialised in the diseases of cattle and their treatment. Many of the tales would seem to reinforce this idea, but the majority of the evidence we do have comes from old oral tradition, so it is difficult to substantiate the claims. Cheap suggested that the book may have been lost or destroyed, as there is little to no contemporary evidence, and the last time we hear of the Red Book being consulted was at the beginning of the 19th century. On the other hand, Gaelic scholar Ronald Black has a more optimistic outlook on the whereabouts of the Red Book. He indicates that a strong case can be made that the book is held within the National Library of Scotland. The book Mr Black was alluding to was given the reference MS 7213. It is bound in a now faded red cover. The text within the book has been scribed beautifully and the inhabited initials are quite elaborate for the time. The book was dated to the early 16th century and comprised of mostly Gallic manuscripts from the 14th to the 16th century. These include a Materia Medica or Journal of Early Pharmacy which demonstrates knowledge of the therapeutic properties of local plants and how they could be used in the treatment of common illnesses. Subjects such as history, mythology, religion and even entertainment are also covered within the manuscripts. It is known that the book once belonged to the Beaton family of physicians from the Isle of Mull in Argyle. This suggests a possible connection to Appen, as one confirmed owner of the book, James Beaton, once attended the Stuarts of Appen as a physician. It was passed down through the family for many years, but eventually sold in 1736 to Robert Freebairn, a bookseller. Robert then kindly donated the book to the Advocates Library in Edinburgh, where it remained until it was transferred to the National Library of Scotland in 1925. The main issue with the belief that MS 7213 was the fabled Red Book of Appen is that it conflicts with many of the tales in which the Man of the Red Book was consulted in the early 19th century when we know the book was stored within the library. It has been suggested by a number of scholars that the concept of a Red Book may have been a generic term in popular culture for a book of mysterious or occult knowledge, but this is largely unfounded. To this day, the truth of the magical Red Book of Appen is still clouded. Did it exist? Did it hold secretive arcane knowledge? Or was it an intriguing early look at veterinary science within Scotland? Who was or were the men of the Red Book? Were they from the Beaton family or the Stuarts of Invernale? But the most important question, was the book stolen from the devil? And if it was, is the great beast still hunting the owner. Thank you for listening.